The light breaks. It's the sun making its slow and measured approach above the horizon. Like many of us, emerging beyond the white curtain, we sing, like Langston Hughes once wrote in the singular, I too sing America. We play without the masks that Dunbar scripted so long ago. And we compose the music that must be, is being heard with ears that would not hear before. We are departing the kitchen of the darker brother. This is the tomorrow, and the table is set. Welcome to Classical Music in Color. I'm Judith Gibson. You've heard of the enslaved woman Sally Hemings and her children with our third president, Thomas Jefferson. Those children left more than their particular genetic connection. Some of them left a musical legacy as fiddlers. And while Juneteenth has come and gone, there's still a lot of music to hear in celebration of this still new federal holiday. Way back in the bad old days, and we mean way back and bad, like in the early years of the 19th century, there were the Hemings boys of Monticello. Fiddlers, not violinists, who performed whenever their owners wanted some music for a party or some other festive occasion. I'm David McCormick. I'm the executive director of Early Music America and the artistic director of Early Music Access Project. David R. McCormick wasn't quite obsessed with fiddlers who were black, but he did do a deep dive into their lives and the music they played. This included the Hemings Boys, the ones fathered by the principal author of the Declaration of Independence and the third president of the United States. Thomas Jefferson, had those children with the enslaved woman, Sally Hemings. I found out about his research and his project in an Early Music America magazine article called Rock and Real, Monticello's Black Fiddlers. Why did you get interested in something like this? So I am um, a Charlottesville, Virginia native, and I've, uh, I, I moved back to town um, after school. So like 12 years ago, I moved back to Charlottesville um, and I'd always been kind of fascinated by Monticello. And, um, you know, somebody probably 10 years ago whispered in my ear, did you know Thomas Jefferson was a violinist? And that caught my attention. And I, um, and the, the collection, his collection uh, is at the University of Virginia Special Collections Library. Um, and so I, I've been interested in, in it for a while. And um, they offered me a fellowship at Monticello at the International Center of Jefferson Studies. Yes, <laughs> it was a really exciting moment for me um, uh, to have this opportunity to have unfettered access to everything, to, to scholars and documents. And um, what's really wonderful about it is that um, they have a lot of information and nobody really understood quite what they had in terms of musical knowledge within those documents. So I was able to come in and, you know, immediately the story that caught my eye was that Thomas Jefferson had three enslaved sons with Sally Hemings who were probably all fiddlers. Um, and immediately I just decided, well, this is the thing. Nothing else matters. <laughs> I want to know more about this. Um, and, uh, and it turned out to be a really, uh, fascinating thing not not just the personal stories which i think is very interesting but the fact that we that we actually know some of the repertoire that they that they played where they played what it sounded like there are these vivid descriptions of their playing mm -hmm. and so um we can we can reconstruct a little bit of that world tell me about Eston hemmings sally hemmings son with thomas jefferson who started this out or were there people before him? So um, my, my sort of working theory on this, the, um, the, the Hemings family was related by marriage to the Scott family of fiddlers. Um, and uh, so Jesse Scott, who uh, his father was the white governor of Kentucky. His mother was from the Pamunkey Indian tribe. 
Okay, yeah. now we have Native Americans involved. Okay. Yes, we do. Um, so uh, Jesse was this powerhouse fiddler. Um, he played for Lafayette's visit to Monticello um, and had these three fiddle, fiddling play, fiddle playing sons with um, one of the Hemings uh, daughters, sisters. I'm getting my, <laughs> the family tree is quite confusing. So at, at any rate, um, Jesse is sort of the elder statesman of, this, of these families in terms of his fiddling prowess. And I, I think that he probably taught his sons and probably taught all three of the Hemings boys to play fiddle. Um, so Eston was the youngest of, of the Hemings boys and um, was the only one that sort of took, took off professionally as a fiddler. Um, his, his oldest, the, the oldest of the boys, Beverly, uh, we know that he played at Monticello, but we don't have any indication of him playing professionally. Um, but Eston, uh, upon gaining his freedom, first was in downtown Charlottesville and then was in Chillicothe, Ohio. And his dance band there was legendary. They were talking about him 100 years later. Um, you know, they're writing about the good old days when Eston Hemmings, the Eston Hemmings band would, um, you know, cause the, the roof to fall off from <laughs> his music. Um, and so his band was fiddle, clarinet, and cello, um, which sounds like a, a classical trio. <laughs> Um, it does. But actually, it's it's more like you know the sort of like the seeds of jazz a little bit. At any rate, you know, Eston was just massively popular in Chillicothe. He was in demand, playing everywhere. Um, but he he wanted to give his family an even better life than that, and so moved to Madison, Wisconsin, and and they passed as white. About them passing as white. Around 1852, he moved his family from Ohio to Wisconsin. They changed their race to white and their surname to Jefferson. You are attempting to recreate the music the way it might have been played back in the 19th century. Yeah, and it's been a real challenge because uh, we have obviously recordings of black fiddlers from the early days of recording, but that doesn't stretch back far enough, of course. Um, and, and we have... Um, you know, we have an idea of the repertoire, but there are these two sort of conflicting things in the repertoire. We've got straight ahead fiddle music. We know that Eston played the Virginia Reel and Money Musk, which was also one of his father's favorite tunes. The Scott family, we actually know quite a bit of the repertoire that, that they played. We know that they were playing lots of reels, including the Virginia reel, um, you know, the, the usual fiddle tunes. But we also see that they were playing the most fashionable opera dances of the day, um, which I haven't really found that anywhere else where, where these, these fiddlers are like on the cutting edge of what's popular in Europe and playing it for these for the white dances, essentially. La Cabre is one of Jefferson's favorite tunes. Um, and we know that from one of his granddaughters who, who wrote down his like three or four favorite Scottish tunes. Um, this is his white granddaughter, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is you performing this music, correct? Yes. You, you're talking about fiddlers versus violinists. Please yes. explain. Yeah, I mean, um, this is if violinists hate this question in a way, <laughs> but, we'll, but we, we, we still answer it. Um, I, I suppose the, the simplest answer for, especially for this time period, um, a, a violinist, quote, air quotes, violinist would be someone who is 
you know, classically trained, learning from a master fiddler to read music and play, um, you know, written down art music. And a fiddler would be someone generally who's from this oral tradition of um, learning by ear from from a usually from a family member or a mentor of some kind. Um, Not reading music. Learn, right. Although I, um, I make an important distinction in sort of the longer version of, of my paper, the presentation version of this paper, that um, the Scots knew how to read music. We, they, they, um, sheet music was discovered in their home when it was torn down. Uh, the Scots were musically literate. Yes. And Jesse Scott reportedly composed quite a few reels. Yes. So they were composers as well and passed this down to the Hemings kids. Yeah, that was a real kind of bombshell moment for me when I realized that Jesse was a composer um, and that the whole family was musically literate. Um, and it's, um, you know, I've had to kind of boil it down to them being fiddlers, but that's that's not the full story. They also reportedly all played flute. Um, Jesse's wife played piano. Um, the grandson played cello. And so um, they could have played in all sorts of different configurations. Um, the, the one, the configuration that most people talk about is three fiddles or two fiddles and a cello, but. You talk about here also in the article, your concern or your interest was in what did this music sound like? How did they play it? And you believe some African roots are involved in black fiddling in America. Yeah, you know, it's, um, there, there are absolutely African fiddles. Um, and so there, there is no doubt that um, there were folks who had played African fiddles who were then confronted with the European <laughs> violin um, and, and, you know, like the first generation of enslaved fiddlers would, would have been carrying over that tradition um, and, and passing it down. And there's, there is a distinctive sound to mm -hmm. black fiddling in, in my opinion. And can you describe it? Um, I can try. <laughs> um, there, there's certainly a, um, and I, I, this is, I mean, some of this is also true about all, all fiddling, but there is a, a compactness to the bow strokes. Um, there is um, what I consider to be a really distinctive and beautiful sort of uh, gruffness to the sound. Um, that I still hear today in um, jazz violinists. Um, and I don't know a single white jazz violinist today that sounds like that. It's, it is the, the stuff smiths of the world who have that really special sound that just um, nobody can replicate. I, I think I'm the first to kind of put all these pieces together <laughs> and talk about the fact that there were in total like 10 fiddlers um, associated with Monticello in this brief period of time, that we're all living at once, we're all creating a vibrant musical scene in Charlottesville, and that that should be a legendary story. It, it, I I shouldn't be the one telling it. What was your best find? So Cinder Stanton is one of the great scholars of slavery at Monticello, and she gave me access to a great deal of her research, um, and she told me kind of early on. She said. I don't think you're really going to find a lot of repertoire as you're searching through these archives and so forth, but you know, I wish you luck. And um, so I just dug and dug and dug and um, sure enough, I kept running across, you know, mentions of operas or specific dances and just started putting dots together. And suddenly, you know, I had this picture of the repertoire that I just, I went into this not thinking I was gonna have. I thought I was gonna have to do kind of a re reverse engineering kind of thing where I looked at fiddle tunes from the next generation and decided which ones I thought might've been passed down. Um, and instead we've got this really vivid picture and there are other Virginia fiddlers where we know a few of their um, repertoire things. So definitely just like the first those first couple of days of when the repertoire started pouring in, I was like, yes, jackpot, we've got this. This is going to be more than a paper. I can give a concert. <laughs>
McCormick is also happy that there is a documentary being made using part of his research. We close this segment of the show with music from that documentary called Black Fiddlers. We were talking with David R. McCormick, the executive director of Early Music America. There are links to the documentary, Black Fiddlers, and other projects mentioned in this story on the Classical Music and Color page on secondstreetdreams.com. Coming up, Juneteenth. It came and went so fast, it seems, but the music lingers on. A month ago, many of us celebrated Juneteenth, the newest federal holiday. Some classical musicians created playlists in honor of the day slavery finally ended in the U.S. For the remembrance and in celebration, your classical the nation's only 24-7 live-hosted classical radio service produced a program of classical music signifying the struggles of black Americans since Emancipation Day, June 19, 1865. The hour-long program presents music composed by African-American classical composers. And there's a vastly different Juneteenth playlist curated by pianist and producer Laura Downs. It's called Songs to Believe In, a Juneteenth playlist. She told me that it was really difficult to come up with one this year. Here's why. Well, this is the second Juneteenth playlist I've done for NPR. And um, I will admit that it was a, a struggle this year. You know, I think in 2021, there was this real sense of energy growing in the country. And so I was reconnecting, I think, with moments in the past, times in, in our American past that have had that similar swell of energy and protest and shift. Um, and so I think that that playlist really, re really reflected that feeling. 2022, really hard to know where to look to find evidence of positive change. You know, at this moment, June, that, you know, there were mass shootings in June. It was just, it's a dark time. And so really what I harnessed was the truth of that, that, you know, this music, especially music by Black composers and across the spectrum of genres, so much of our music is that persistent um, reminder, you know, that, that hope is essential, no matter what's going on, no matter how bad things are. So that was really my motivation this year, just to, you know, a reminder that really the only thing we can do is keep hoping and keep working. And it's in the hardest times that we try the hardest. So she populated it with spirituals, jazz, gospel from Aretha Franklin among others, and fresh music from John Baptiste, Jesse Montgomery, and Carlos Simon. Look for the links on the Classical Music and Color page on secondstreetdreams.com. Our coda this month is a big shout out to my listeners all over the world. Thank you. I am astounded and also oh pleased that I have listeners in India, Germany, Japan, France, Brazil, Kenya, Spain, Italy, and of course the United States. And while it took two years, I have finally hit a thousand downloads for classical music in color, staccato, and composer's cadenza. That may not sound like a lot to you, but it is to me. Thank you so much. If you have any comments or suggestions to share, I'd like to read them. There's a link on secondstreetdreams.com. I'd also like to thank the mainstream and some not so mainstream classical music organizations who are making an effort to add more chairs to the table and to color outside the lines. They're bringing other voices into their administrations and on their stages. 
All I ask is that you don't go back to the way it was. If you have to rack your brain to find music suitable for your audience while gently bringing them into the 21st century vibe, then do it. It's a good thing. There is one more edition of Classical Music in Color coming up this summer. It'll feature the 2022 Richard Tucker Award winner, Soprano Angel Blue. And on Composer's Cadenza, I'll be talking with composer Carlos Simon about his new album, Requiem for the Enslaved. Our next Classical Music in Color comes up in mid-September. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy like your life depends on it, because it does. We are the Second Street Dreams Audio Network on the radio and on the Triple W. Thank you for listening to the July 2022 edition of Classical Music in Color. I'm Judith Gibson.